All right, so yeah, thank you very much for coming to uh, Five Steps to Ace the JLPT at any level. Um, we've been talking about the reasons why you take past tests. And basically, you need to do that as a diagnostic, okay, to understand where your strengths and weaknesses are. <laughs> now, when you do those tests, you need to do them in test conditions. So that means locking yourself away in the room and voting the time that's on the top of the question booklet to answering those questions, okay? So there you see, 100 marks, 35 minutes. Okay, you need to be really strict with that and uh, not to sit there with the answers um, and, and checking them as you go. Okay, it's really important to do the whole test in a block. Um, because um, you're going to um, start to use um, start to use those techniques uh, that you'll need on test day. Yeah, that's right. And this is a standardised test, and test techniques are going to earn you extra marks. Okay. I haven't done any of those uh, test prep classes. <laughs> and, you know, they, they range in price um, as well from, uh, I saw one uh, a video lesson um, for $95 advertised um, through um, the la over the last couple of weeks as, I was, as I've been researching. Um, this particular presentation and uh, getting together my blog posts. Every time I opened Gmail, there was a new ad for me about, um, you know, acing the, the JLPT. And uh, one of them was a, a video lesson for, it was $95. Um, yeah, I don't think you need to pay that much. Um, and some of the courses that you find um, at Japanese language schools around the place will be anywhere from, say, $300 to $600. That's right. So there's a lot of money to be made uh, in test preparation for this particular test. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, the reasons we do those practice tests is to work out what our strengths and weaknesses are. Okay. I'll... Um, I'll come to strength and weaknesses in a bit, um, but I want to focus on one other aspect of the test, and that is um, understanding exactly what the requirements of the test are. Okay, so you don't want to have any surprises um, on test day. You want to make sure that you know exactly how long um, each section is for your particular level and you also want to know exactly what kind of questions to expect. So what kinds, uh, what kinds of things can you tell me about the test? If you've seen a practice test, what have you noticed on a very general, um, in a very general sense? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so for each level, uh, there are different requirements okay, uh, for your vocabulary and kanji. Now, just to add a, add a small twist to that, um, and a bit of a reality check as well, uh, how many 
how many words, you have a look at the pages, the, con the contents of the JLP there, and just tell me how many words does the JLPT expect you to know at level one? How many words? Okay, 10,000. Does anyone have any idea what the average high school student in Japan, uh, the average vocabulary of a high school student in Japan? Does anyone know that? Be surprised, Philip. Yes, this is going to blow you away. I'll have to find the link for this. I'll have to find the link for this and, and confirmation of it. Um, but when I was studying for uh, NICU, um, the realization that um, even if you do um, ICU, you're never going to get close to the vocabulary that a Japanese high school student has when they leave school. The average Japanese high school student has between 30,000 and 40,000 words in their vocabulary. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so the JLPT is uh, a very small subset of that. When you think about it, the reason that they do this is to keep it standardized. Okay, so they only focus on uh, standard Japanese and a reasonable amount of words that an average foreigner would be expected to know to be able to do those uh, things or live um, a normal life in Japan. <laughs> yes, the questions are, I think the questions are. Okay, so you've got to, um, you've got to understand that there is a difference between um, having a very fine um, control of grammar and a very good understanding of um, kanji and being able to speak the language. They're two very, very different things, okay? The 30,000 to 40,000 words um, that I mentioned a little earlier aren't all standard Japanese. Uh, a lot of it is uh, slang uh, and a lot of it is um, regional dialects that um, may or may not appear in the standard Japanese dictionary. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so because the test has no speaking component, and they can only test you on what you can read and what you can listen to, it's a, it's, it's a skewed, it'll give you a very skewed picture of your ability. But you can pass the test without ever having to speak a word of Japanese. So in order to get a um, a very well-rounded understanding of Japanese. Immersion is good. Speaking is good. You'll never get um, you'll never get fluency in Japanese, and you'll never be able to hold a conversation, um, you know, comfortably by focusing on the test alone. So um, it is a very um, skewed approach to learning Japanese if you only focus on the test. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so even so, the reason that you, well, one of the reasons that I took the test was uh, so I had something to aim for. Okay. The test itself is not the ultimate goal, but proficiency in the Japanese language is. Okay. And it's not the test per se that's going to improve your Japanese. It's all the study leading up to it. Okay. Yeah, Jeff, that, 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 um, that's only, only part of the answer, I reckon. Uh, Jeff said that we should focus on learning Japanese but use the test as a gauge. Yes, it is a gauge, but only in those very narrow areas of um, vocabulary and grammar 
and listening comprehension. Yes, okay, that, that was the real important point for me there, Nathan, um, that it gives you a reason to study. It gives you a reason to study, okay? If um, your only motivation for studying Japanese was um, so I can hold a conversation in a pub, then you'd spend all the time in the pub, okay? And you wouldn't really learn um, the vocabulary that you uh, needed to deal with people in business or you wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, learn how to uh, greet, um, you know, someone with respect and all of that sort of stuff. So, yeah. No worries, Min. Thanks for coming. Okay. So, yes, knowing the knowing the limitations of of the test and uh, knowing uh, what you can, well, what you stand to gain out of it, is very important. Um, not only for doing well in the test, but for making sure um, that your motivation is in the right place. Johnny! Brings me to my next uh, point. Um, study the test, not just the Japanese, okay? If you want to pass the test, study how the test works. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right. Yes, I think that's deliberate. I think you have to listen to them on the test. On the test pages. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Jamila. That's right. Um, to give you an example of, you know, everyone has their own reasons for being in Japan, and uh, some of them are just to have a bit of an adventure and have some fun. And you can't, you can't really blame people for um, not studying um, Japanese. But when you get to say ten years or twelve years in Japan, and you know. You've got to have a very good reason not for speaking Japanese, I reckon, when you get to that stage. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, so let's uh, move on. You've got to train your weaknesses, okay? We talked about this before when um, we talked about doing the practice tests, okay? The practice tests are going to um, uncover areas for improvement. Okay. Uh, if we go through some of the different um, question types, there's about six, about six question types in uh, the grammar section. Um, there, there's about mm, four question types. Um, in the vocabulary section, and the two question, um, maybe four question types, two main questions in the listening, and two different ways of answering. Okay, um, one of uh, in the listening uh, section, one of the test question types has a picture associated with it, and the second question type is just sounds only, okay, no pictures, okay, so no clues. Um, the benefit of doing a practice test, um, it gets you into the rhythm of uh, doing those, uh, those questions. Um, and it also um, highlights um, where you might be deficient in an area. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so once you find out what those weaknesses are, that's where you need to spend most of your time. Um, pretty fast. When you get up to uh, NICU, it's a little bit faster than, uh, say, YONQ. Yeah. Uh, and that's why you need to do those listening uh, sections um, in the practice tests. 
so that you can get used to the um, the rhyme and the meter and all of those other um, characteristics of the human voice. There are actually only about um, two or three voices all the way through uh, the test. They must use the same people every year, or they must have a very big bank of questions that were um, recorded by only a, few, a handful of people. So you get to recognize um, those voices. <laughs> Good question. That's a very good question. It's on uh, um, huge speakers that sit out the front of the classroom. Okay, so there is, um, if you are in a large classroom, there is a, um, a difference in sound from front to back. Okay. Question. They do make it very loud though, so I wouldn't worry too much about not hearing. It's the other things in the listening test that um, aren't part of the recording that will distract you more than anything, okay? So it might be the person next to you that, um, yeah, that's right, I never ever had any problems hearing it. The biggest problems are to do with your environment. So, it, you know, you might be in a noisy testing center with, uh, uh, you know, with a, with a road, um, you know, passing by the window or something like that. Or you might be uh, sitting next to somebody who has, has a cold and has to um, sniffle every, you know, 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so it's those other environmental factors that are really going to distract you. Um, and those environmental factors are a really good reason to do the practice tests under test conditions. Because... Even though you lock yourself away in your bedroom and put your headphones on to study the test, um, to do those practice tests, um, you might have interruptions from time to time. You might have, there will be parts when your mind wanders and you need to very quickly bring uh, your focus back on to answering those test questions. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, yeah, so in the Northern Hemisphere, certainly winter. And uh, I always you used to get really rugged up, so layers and layers, okay? And uh, because you have to sit for a very long time, and of course, if your legs are going to get cold and your bum's going to get cold, then that's not very much fun. Comfort is very, very important. Hey, Will. Hey, I didn't notice you down there. Hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for getting up so early. Good effort. <laughs> All right. Any other Australians in the class? Any other people from the Southern Hemisphere? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes, very early. So summer brings with it a whole set of different challenges. Okay, is the air conditioning going to be too cold? Um, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, is it going to be too hot when you leave the um, the comfort of the testing room? All the time now. About half past four. <laughs> Crazy, hey? Yeah. Um, I'll come to that point a little bit later as well. Um, you might think it's a bit weird for me to be up at this hour, but um, I've actually tuned into it now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Okay, once you know where your weaknesses are, you've got to spend um, most of your time there working on your weaknesses, okay? And I know that um, you may not enjoy grammar, okay? Or you may not enjoy your kanji repetitions, um, but you have to focus on your weaknesses because um, small gains, small gains in those very difficult areas are going to um, result in large gains in other areas. Let me see if I can give you an example for that. Let's say that you've got really good kanji, and you've got excellent um, kanji skills, and 
you know, way above your um, chosen level for the test. But your grammar sucks. Okay. When it comes to the reading section, your understanding of verb conjugations and your understanding of um, how sentences fit together and your understanding of words uh, that perform certain functions in Japanese, your understanding of that grammar is going to help you with your reading comprehension. Okay, So when you look at that long reading passage and all you can understand are the readings of the kanji, you won't be able to understand um, how that essay fits together and um, what the intention of the author is or um, how to answer the questions. Okay? So the questions are going to be um, those that require you to have an understanding of uh, how uh, that essay or what the meaning of the essay is. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a much more global and holistic um, thing than just knowing the singular meaning of, um, of a kanji or a kanji compound. <laughs> I've not, never done the SAT, but um, I can imagine that our, um, some of our matriculation tests in Australia are very similar. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, find find your weaknesses. Do things that are really tough, okay? And they will help you uncover much larger gains in other areas, okay? Um, it's the principle of leverage, or you might call it the eighty twenty rule, or something like that. Ah, right. I missed that one. Sorry. Thanks for bringing it up again, Cara. Uh, no, they don't. Um, in the listening part of the test, they will um, they'll play like a test or an, uh, an example question. Play an example question. They'll ask you, um, is that loud enough? And then they just get straight into um, the test. And they don't pause at any time. Okay, the CD just plays all the way through um, until the very end of the test. <laughs> Yeah, that's another good question, Nathan. The, um, the compounds are uh, more important as you get into, say, level 3 and level 2 and level 1. Okay. Um, in the first section, uh, you'll need to have um, a better understanding of, say, the on and the, and the kun readings for each kanji. But when you get to the reading section at the end, you'll have to have an understanding of um, how that fits into a sentence and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, Jeff, do you mean the, the listening the listening section? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. All right, so the listening section um, does have particular challenges in it, and uh, it's a, that's a very good reason for doing the practice tests. Basically, what happens is you get given a question. Okay, there's a very small pause. Um, no, sorry, you get given an ex like an example set of um, sentences, a conversation. Um, you know, someone's talking about something. Um, you're listening into it, um, and then there's a question about that listening. Okay. Um, let's see if I can find an example. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of a question. I'll read it out to you. One second. Oh no, no transcripts in the book. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll show you a picture anyway. Yeah. 
Okay, so for the picture type questions, uh, you'll be given four options. Okay, so you're looking at this, and uh, the question will be something like, uh, what is this person talking about? What kind of fruit is this person talking about? Okay, well, what kind of fruit does she want to set on the table? And then you'll hear a lady speaking. She'll be giving instructions or something like that. And uh, then you'll get that question one more time. And you only have uh, 10 seconds, basically, to uh, write the answer on the answer sheet, or fill in the, fill in the circle on the answer sheet. <laughs> it's not written. It's only, it's only oral. In the listening test, there's no written questions. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's very constant. There's about um, 30 questions in the listening section. So you get about one question per minute. And the dialogue goes for about um, you know, 20 seconds. And then the four questions go for another 20 seconds. And you've got, say, 20 seconds to answer it. So it's very um, by the clock. All of the spoken instructions for the test are in Japanese. Uh, are they level appropriate? Yes. I'll say yes, because even even at level um, even at level one, even at EQ, they're pretty much the same instructions, but they are geared towards um, yeah, the lower levels. Yes, there is. Yeah, only, only very short though, very short pause. So use that pause, use that pause to regather your thoughts. Okay, don't spend too much time thinking about the last question. Once you've answered it, you've got to move on to the next one, because um, there's no chance to go back and review in the listening section. That's really important. You'll get no um, no chance to rewind the CD. Um, there's nothing written, so there's no chance to review. <laughs> Um, also in the listening test, about halfway through the second question, there is a pause, um, and they give you about 30 seconds to clear your mind, um, take a few deep breaths, and start again. Okay. Bracing your strengths. Um, you may have noticed that there's a bit of a theme going on here. <laughs> uh, when I was uh, going to university, I was part of the University Cycling Club, and uh, we used to, um, yeah, we used to do a lot of uh, practice races. The best advice that I was ever given about being a good cyclist was to train your weaknesses and race your strengths, and. Um, find out where your weaknesses are and uh, put all of your energy into doing that in training. But when it comes to race day, okay, focus on the things that you're good at. Okay. Now there's two things that can happen um, when you race your strengths. That is, you don't, um, you don't, you're not too hard on yourself um, for the things that you're not naturally gifted with. <laughs> Okay, so the things, um, you know, I was, um, I was never going to be a standout climber because I'm slightly a larger frame. And even though um, my body weight got to around uh, 69 uh, kilograms at one stage, I was never going to be as light or as zippy up the hills as uh, some of my competitors who were, say, 60, 62 kilos. And, uh, you know, rather than starve myself silly to lose um, weight and uh, to uh, go up hills faster, I decided that, yes, I would focus my training on uh, hill climbing because the technique that I, that I learn in hill climbing is going to keep me in the pack uh, over those difficult sections. But it's also going to help me when it comes to racing um, the flats 
where I was naturally gifted anyway. Okay, so um, training, your weak, uh, training your weaknesses and racing your strengths will free up a lot of emotional energy. Um, the other tip, the other side of that coin is that you don't want to spend all of your time in training doing the things that you're really good at. Okay. So you may be excellent at, um, at your kanji repetitions, okay? Like a, the example that I used before, you may be, um, yeah, you may be, you may have an excellent um, vocabulary. Okay? You may have, let's say, level three, um, you know, requires you to know about 1,500 words. Let's say that you know 3,000 words, okay? And um, you love um, doing repetitions on Smart FM. Um, because you can increase your vocabulary so quickly. That's not going to help you when it comes to test day. Okay? Um, because you, uh, you can't get more than 100% in the vocabulary section. Okay? If you um, focus all, all your energy on the things that you're good at, the other things are going to suffer. Okay? There's a law of diminishing returns here. You get to say, um, you know, eighty percent of the um, total vocabulary in, in in one section. You might be getting eighty percent on your practice tests um, for vocabulary. I wouldn't spend too much time on that, on on practicing or increasing your vocabulary, if your scores in the grammar and in the listening section are at fifty and sixty, because that means that come race day you're not going to be prepared for those sections and um, you stand a very real chance of failing the test even though you've got a really good score in vocabulary. So, save it. Save it for race day. Does anyone have something that they really love to do? Maybe you can share that with us in the chat window. Is there something there that you love to do? Eat. <laughs> Can't eat in the test center. <laughs> oh yeah. They're pretty strict. If your mobile phone goes off, that's it. They'll take you out of the classroom and you don't get a chance to sit the other, other parts of the test. <laughs> okay. So, okay, all right. Um, Jamila loves the kanji study. Yeah. And Jeff loves the anime. So um, Jeff might be um, improving his listening, okay? but remember out of 400 marks, listening is only worth 100. Okay? So even if Jeff gets 100% perfect score for listening, but gets uh, less than 50 in the other two sections, he's not going to pass that test. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and speaking. Okay, so um, like I said before, the JLPT is basically a test for reading comprehension okay, and listening comprehension. It doesn't test your speaking. So if you spend all of your time talking to people, and, and like I do, talking to people about um, taking the test, that's not actual practice for taking the test. Okay. It's kind of meta. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's okay though. I mean, you've got to understand what your motivation for learning Japanese is. And if it's just to pass the test, then you're not getting a very well-rounded education. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, having a good test score isn't going to help you make friends. 
<laughs> that's that's a good point, Nathan. No, not really. But you know, you've got to have the right strategy in place, okay? And uh, the reason that I put this together for you guys was because I wanted to make sure that you were um, heading down the right path. Um, that you've got the right um, the right strategy in place, so that you're doing all of all of the right things um, in the lead up to the test, okay? Um, you know, one hour with me, um, if we just spend one hour looking at a few minor grammar points, um, we could get about two, we could get through two or three. We get through two or three, and that'd be two or three grammar points for one um, level of the test, um, and that wouldn't be of benefit to everybody. So um, hopefully we're using this principle of leverage here, that if I tell you a little bit about um, the strategy that worked for me, maybe you can take something away from this class and put that to work for you. And because, I mean, you guys, you have to do the hard work. I don't have to do the hard work. I'm not even doing the test this year, okay? You guys have to do all the hard work. Um, but knowing um, how to do that is more important, okay? I guess I'm in the business of how more than anything. Ah, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's all about reading comprehension. I mean, I, I went through um, a, a, a situation in, in Japan uh, towards the end there where my company was um, being uh, torn apart and uh, it, you know, collapsed and I had to read Japanese newspaper reports um, to get an understanding of the, the consequences of, of um, the company going bankrupt. Um, so I could relay that information to my fellow teachers and uh, so I could make the best decisions for myself and my family. So having reading comprehension there at that stage was really important to me. Grammar. Oh, I'll show you a really good book. This one, what's this one? This is Sankyu. The preparatory course for the JLPT, Bumpo Hen. Okay, I've got a couple of books like this, and they focus on uh, grammar points. They also have CDs in the back, okay, so you can do that listening. Um, and they have sample questions each time you go through. So. Um, the example that I've got here is. Daro, okay. Daro, okay. Ashito wa samui daro. So um, it talks about the various meanings of daro and the the, the usage of uh, the show and that kind of thing. And uh, then it's got a sample question and test your knowledge on it. Um, I'll share these links with you in an email to follow this lesson if you wish. Um, I've got a couple of other good resources I want, want to get together. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jeff, that's a good question too. At this particular point in time, I don't think I... <laughs> yeah. They may consider it at, at some point in the future, but I think in the last couple of years, their focus has been on um, modernising uh, the test, I think. All right, um, so just one last thing uh, before I head off, and uh, probably the most important thing for um, test day, stay fresh. <laughs> um, you know, you've got to take your study um, with a grain of salt. Don't take yourself too seriously, you know. Um, it's only a test, so don't spend the night before. I reckon he looks pretty fresh. He's in his Sunday best. <laughs> the wind's flowing through his hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Um, you know, just enjoy life and uh, and take it as it comes. And it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world if um, you know if you don't pass the test. Your um, physical preparation um, for the test is just an, as important as your intellectual preparation. Yeah, that's right. Um, Jeff's made the very good point that uh, if you study um, just before a test or in the morning of the test, um, you stand a very good chance of sabotaging yourself. Because there's a lot of stuff that you're trying to cram into your short-term memory that doesn't last very long. And it has the um, potential to dislodge other stuff that's been there for a long time. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you know it or you don't. Yeah. You wouldn't be doing um, tests like this if you knew everything. So, so that's nay, Will. Well done. Ashita wa samui daro. Kyomo da, kyomo. Ooh, it's a little windy and cold here in Brisbane. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're probably right. Probably right. Oh yeah, the other thing. Um, so Will and I are up, up kind of early. The big difference um, between Will's situation and my situation is that um, I've gotten into this routine now where every morning I wake up at 3 a.m. to prepare for a 4 a.m. class. So even on the days that uh, I'm not waking up at 3 a.m., um, that's what time I naturally get up. My, my body clock has um, recalibrated so that I'm up before the sun seven days a week. Ah, there, yeah, there we go. Uh, 9 p.m. 9 p.m. So, most of um, most of the people I know go to bed at say 11 or 12 at night. Okay, so we just have, um, I'm just sort of in a different time zone, really. <laughs> so in between, yeah, I get say five to six hours sleep um, every night, which is enough. Which is enough. And uh, these days, I don't even need my alarm to get out of bed in the morning. That's how um, how much of a routine it is. 5 a.m.? Uh, okay. So in between 5 and 6, well, sometimes at 5 I have another class. Um, but if I don't, have, I don't have anything on after this class, I'll um, maybe blog a little bit um, and then get ready for work. Uh, I leave the house at 6.30. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so even when I get to work, I'm pretty much the first person at work, and that gives me um, about an hour or so to um, to get things done before uh, the phone starts ringing and before people come in and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Um, and having a routine is really important. Um, when I was preparing for the JLPT, uh, every weekend, say, on a Saturday and a, and a Sunday, uh, the kids would go to bed. Um, well, my first son, uh, Renault, he would go to bed at, say, um, uh, 11 o'clock for his morning nap or just after lunch or something like that. As soon as he went down, uh, bang, I'd jump in to um, a test mode and uh, do um, one section of the test. Um, and pretty much I was around to um, completing the test when he started to wake up and I'd, do, I'd go through and um, find out which ones I'd done wrong. Later that evening, um, I'd organise my study around uh, the things that I got wrong. And I, I want to show you one thing. Uh, this is a breakdown of uh, some answers to the practice tests, the results that I got. I don't know how much of it you'll be able to see. Um, okay, so you can see there I've ruled up some pages. Uh, you probably can't see very much, but basically 
for each type of question uh, I've got a score. Okay, so for the 1991 test I got uh, 32 out of 40 for the first type for the first question in uh, Moji Goy and uh, 24 out of 50 for the second question and 56 out of 90 for the third question. Okay, so knowing that um, I was doing pretty well in the first and third questions, I had to practice the second kind of question um, in the vocabulary section. So you can get down to a really fine um, degree of control if you do those practice tests. Find it exactly where your weaknesses are and then choose the right um, choose the right study material to address those weaknesses. <laughs> right, get some exercise. Uh, I, I guess I have to share with you the latest blog post on this. It's just a bit of a wrap up. And, yeah, I'll share with you the, the fifth step because I don't think you guys got that in, in my last email to you. Um, but there will be another blog post either today or tomorrow morning um, with uh, links to all of the resources that I've mentioned in these posts and in this um, presentation. grab a link for you. Uh -huh. Kan, yes. Best way to remember kanji. Lots of repetition and writing. Now I know that the JLPT doesn't um, test your writing skills, but writing kanji is a, um, a really good way of remembering it because you build up what's known as a muscle memory. Yeah. Kara's got the right idea. I'll just, um, I'll show you a book. This is known as the Kanji Gakshu Step. Yeah, this is uh, for Kanji Kente. Kanji Kente is a test, uh, a standardized Japanese test for native speakers in Kanji. And uh, inside the book, inside the book, there are um, spaces to write. You see, actually, writing in the book itself. And uh, one of the advantages of it is that there's uh, level appropriate sentence structures. So yeah, a lot of people just focus on the readings of the kanji, but um, that's not the best way to get a very well-rounded education in kanji. You've also got to write. Okay, so you can see here the 10. Yeah. 10, 7, you've got a couple of different compounds, let's read one of them out. Ama no gawa ga kirei da. Okay. So the Milky Way is beautiful. You've got um, level appropriate sentences there um, to help you get more context for the kanji. And tempura with a little picture here. Okay. Tempura. <laughs> um, so there's that and writing practice.
<laughs> okay. So you probably can't see that either, but um, one of these pages would probably take me about um, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, I'd spend maybe 30 or 40 minutes each day just writing. That's hard work. It takes a lot of discipline. Uh, best to do it in the in the early morning when you are fresh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and again, I'll share those links with you in uh, in the wrap up post. How so, Nathan? <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about it. Oh yeah, yeah, muscle memory. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, what's this? Can you see it? What am I? Yay! Jeff, good work. Yay! Uh, let's see. Hang on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Jamila. Nani. <laughs> oh, good on you. Well done. <laughs> oh dear. Isn't that funny? Okay, so yeah, you've got to get your body into it, okay? You've got to get your body into it. <laughs> um one of the um one of the slogans um at my English school in Japan was um uh Yoku Shabareru. Um, yoku kiku. Okay, so lots of listening, lots of speaking. That was for the conversational aspect of it. The other one was mini tsuku. Okay, so get it into your body. Mini tsuku. Okay, if you get the language into your body, then it's going to stay there a lot longer. Um, so muscle memory is part of that. Okay, doing the writings, reading out loud. Okay, you've got to connect all of your sentences to that knowledge. Okay, and the stronger the, you make those connections, uh, the lot longer that knowledge is going to last. <laughs> no worries, Mary. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, and I should wrap up. Let's see. It's it. I've gone well over time, but uh, it's been good fun. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much for coming. Um, I'm going to give you my email address. You can get in touch with me whenever you like. You've also got uh, my website address there as well. I'll give that to you in just a second. Um, you'll see um, resources from this presentation um, up on Edufier soon, this presentation, and a whole bunch of links and other things like that. Um, also, the recording of this presentation um, if you if you want to um, go over some of the points that we've covered, will be available on your dashboard at any time. Um, thanks very much for the reminder. And just uh, if you have any questions about the test, more specific questions, you might be most welcome to get in contact with me. Okay. So um, thanks very much for coming, people. Don't forget to sign up for Superpass if you haven't done that already, and uh, and try one of my other classes, Japanese for Absolute Beginners, or Japanese for Beginners. Um, thanks, everyone. I'll see you later. Let's go to some of this. <laughs> Human kanji. Hey, I'll have have. That sounds great. I'll have to um, yeah.
to, to do some thinking about that. I'll put some thought into it and see if we can do some human kanji. Hi, <laughs> doitashimashite. See you guys later. Amen.